This episode of Cars Coffee Theology is sponsored by Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. TEDS is a broadly evangelical seminary community united around the gospel of the life, death, resurrection, and return of Christ Jesus. They offer educational programs that prepare men and women to engage in God's redemptive work in the world in many global and vocational contexts, such as counseling, academic teaching and writing, pastoral leadership, and missional service in increasingly diverse contexts. With a wide variety of degrees, both on campus and online, Trinity is known for cultivating excellence in evangelical scholarship. For more information on Trinity's degree programs, visit teds.edu. It was so great to have my good friend and fellow New Testament scholar Nick Perrin in town for the show. At the time of the recording, Nick was a professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, but he has since moved on to become the president at my alma mater, Trinity International University in Chicago. We enjoyed an in-depth discussion of Nick's excellent book, Jesus the Priest. Cars, coffee, theology. Well, welcome to Cars, Coffee, Theology, brother. I'm well, very glad you're here. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, the first question I often ask my guests, and I don't know if you've watched any of their episodes. If not, no problem. No, but uh, looking forward to it. just as well. Aha, uh-huh, busted. You haven't yeah, even watched no. any episodes. I, I thought yeah, we were I friends. Really <laughs> Come on. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't read my Sermon on the Mount book either. I, I, I like I, I said, other, I memorized uh, reading Gospels wisely. I yeah, was in any chapter. Uh, all right. Anyways, <laughs> anyway, uh, my students love that. Just for the record. Good. Good. Do you use that as a textbook? I do. Oh, that was nice. I didn't realize that. Right. Okay. So n- now, yeah. now am I okay. atoned for? Atoned. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the, an early question I like to ask people is actually, what was your first car? Oh yeah, a 1979 Chevy Chevette. <laughs> all right. Um, and oh wait, no, I'm sorry, that was my second car. Uh, first car was a 1980 Dodge Horizon. Okay, what is the Horizon? I'm trying to think oh, of that. Oh, like, like the like it was like the Omni. Um, okay. so yeah, a little hatchback. Okay, um, and the Chevette was a step up. Step, step, <laughs> I told it to step up with the Chevette. Uh, my Chevette is my favorite car because I had the thing for years and I would do my own work on it. Okay, and the back in the days when one could work his own car, right? right? So, right. I, uh, so, oh, do you want to hear a good story about it? Please, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how much time. Yeah, that's fine. But uh, so, um, well, like what the one thing my my wife noticed when we were dating is that it didn't have a floor really. I mean, there are big holes, so you've been driving on the highway and look at the pavement right, under right. you. And, and she also noticed <laughs> right. that instead of a shifter, I had an uh, ice pick that I stick into the. This was a manual. Yeah, it yeah, was okay. a total manual. Yeah, but yeah. sometimes, like. You, if you didn't know where the shifter was, you'd be in trouble when you had to go in reverse. So, or put in park or any right. of those combinations. And so, you, and she was still willing to marry you. Yeah, with an I know, right? Yeah, you know, she holes thought, in the she was thought it was cool, and then, you know, then it became less see, cool, right, see, right. right? So, uh, but here's the funny story: is you know, I just had problems starting the car, and uh, now and then, but I knew what to do. I crawl under the car and I hold up a screwdriver of course. and jump the spark. Um, of course. In solenoid, right? <laughs> and, but you need someone to turn the key. So anyway, it was, I was going to the church picnic and someone asked me to pick up uh, Larry and Cheryl and they were blind. They were congenitally blind. And I said, Cheryl, pick, pick them up the picnic. And it's this hot August day in Cumberland, Maryland. Right. And I picked them up. I said, hey, I got to get watermelon at the store going to the store you know they're in the back seat kind of doing their thing you know and I go in the store I come back I get in the driver's seat I turn the key and nothing happens and I'm like I I can't do anything I'm stuck with these guys it's a hot day and I said okay Larry I said I need your help I said I'm going to need you in the driver's seat and I I need I need you to turn the crank to turn the key (laughs) now he's blind he's he's obviously blind right right? so we practice I put his hand on the key I got him in the seat I pulled him out put him in the seat put his hand my hand on his look at give the feel what it's like to turn the key right right. and I said so when I say turn you turn right and so I'm getting under there I've got my screwdriver up there (laughs) ready to go I say okay Larry turn I said Larry turn and you know we're kind of going at it and I kind of got a spark and as we're kind of working on this, I hear this deep voice saying, what's going on here? <laughs> and I look and I see the cuffs of a police officer, <laughs> like on the like, tractor cuffs. Like you're, like you're hijacking it with, a, I mean, with a blind like, guy dude, as your getaway dude, driver. Like you've right? never lived until you're explaining to the officer of law what a blind guy is doing behind your steering wheel. And, but somehow I, I got That's out funny. of it. So that did you get was, it started? I did. Okay, I good. did. Good. I, I did. So and was that, at that some was, point you realized, that's the beauty. I'd say it's time to get a new starter, right? right? Okay. No, and then, right. and then I finally kind of sold it pretty 
years later, pretty close to what I bought it for. So um, okay. it was it was, it was the Chevette. It was talking. a seven nine okay. Chevette. Okay. They, you know, they cranked those things off the assembly line every oh, thirty yeah. seconds, man. They were but Chevette, some of them yeah. were pretty sweet cars. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, that's excellent. What are you driving now? Uh, what, well, we just got a Highlander. Um, okay. So so. Uh, yeah, but I prefer to drive this old Sienna, uh, 2004 Sienna we got. That was an accident, and I just uh, think it's kind of cool that the body's massively damaged, and I really don't care okay. what happens to that car. Okay. You know, right. so you hit a post, you go, oops, great. Okay. It's kind of fun. So is that the kind of driver you are, kind of a hit, hit a post kind of driver? <laughs> you no, know, it's, it's not. Your Enneagram it, 8's it, coming like, out. Like, like you're not right. You I was, know, I was hoping to get at least five it's minutes into the episode the before we bring you. <laughs> right. But you're an eight, you're an eight right? I, I'm an eight okay. wing seven. Okay. So, so I'm mean, but there's a fun part of me too. Okay, good. <laughs> so okay. yeah, there you go. Is that what your business card says? Mean <laughs> exactly. but fun. Mean but fun. Okay. Siri, give me a number between 1 and 289. Okay, so what I like to do is, now you have several books we could talk about, but I want to talk about Judas the Priest. Okay. And Siri has given us the number 10. You can put your coffee down there. Yep. Right, and if, you'll, um, if you'll just turn to page 10 and just read, okay. read a paragraph there oh. and... Uh, you could choose the paragraph and see if you agree with it and it makes sense. And we I might, hope so. Yes, I'm sure it will. Um, well, there's not a full paragraph. That's but, fine. Okay. Uh, I'll just start top of the page. With the, okay. dis- with the disparaging phrase, religion of observance, Boltmann, of course, meant that Judaism had devolved to a religion of meaningless externalities. Accordingly, the day-to-day operations of the cult and the life of the temple had become nothing more than trifling legal formality, and therefore virtually irrelevant not only to many pious Jews who deserve better, but also to Jesus himself, good neo-Kantian that he was. Sentiments such as Boltmann's are exactly the kind of thing Sanders has in mind when he draws up his excoriating and broad-sweeping indictment. But sentiments such as these also explain why the vast bulk of Jesus' scholarship has neglected the temple, despite clear indications in the second temple literature of its utmost significance and its reconstruction of Jesus. It is, is it going too far to suggest that the current disregard of Israel's cultists within contemporary Jesus studies is at least indirectly related to the anti-Judaistic uh, and therefore anti-cultic paradigm instantiated in Boltmann? I think not. For my part, I believe, uh, hope and trust, the current project stand, uh, that the current project actually stands near the culmination of a guildwide effort to escape the conscious or unconscious anti-Judaism of our academic forebearers and, and to allow Jesus to be a fully-fledged Jew of his time. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah, so it's always interesting to read something out loud. I, I said this to you in a text the other day when I was reading the book. I was happy to repeat it now. I feel like you write with a lot of verve. I mean, that, that paragraph, but other parts as well, just there's a lot of strength and I think a lot of cleverness in your writing, Thank too. You. Um, maybe you were, you know, it can feel kind of weird to read a dense paragraph out loud, you know, but I, I feel like <laughs> Stumbling you're, you're writing. Stumbling through my own prose yeah, there. Yeah, but. it happens. But, the, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think you are a very good writer. Even though you, you know, you kind of start by talking about Boltmann and others, at the end of that, you were starting to get to the thesis of the book to some right. degree. Do you want to yeah. say something about so that? So Siri picked out a good number for us yep, because you, we kind of landed on what the book's trying to do. Yeah. And that that's to bring the, the temple and, and Jesus' pre- role within that as, uh, as high priest. Uh, back to center stage when we talk about the historical Jesus. So the point I'm trying to make there, and I make a similar point in terms of how Protestantism has engaged with uh, Catholicism, is that historically, at least over the past 200 years, Protestants have been a little bit leery of all things cultic um, and have kind of said to themselves, and maybe this has a lot to do with Kant, who I mentioned uh, earlier today. Cultic meaning related to the it's Jewish temple. To the temple. Particular. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it's so practices. Cultic right. and temple-like. Right. Is Protestantism has never really known quite what to do with all that stuff and sees that as a kind of minor 
um, footnote in the in the life of Jesus. But in, in point of fact, the temple is absolutely huge in Jewish thought. And so if Jesus is here to say something big to Judaism, it's got to include the temple on some level. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, but I think you're still, I don't, I think you still are saying something more you might want to say about what oh, the book, right? Well, okay. Go, go so, ahead. Like, so what's the going. thesis of this book? So the thesis. So you had an earlier book. That this uh, is the second uh, of a right. trilogy. So this is the second right. of a trilogy. Uh, and God willing, get all three books done. Right. Uh, first book, Jesus of Jesus the Temple, came out, uh, oh my, 2010. And so there I argue that Jesus, uh, the historical Jesus, saw himself as a kind of sacred space, um, a moving, breathing, living sacred space. And Jesus the priest, I, I don't necessarily build on that argument, but it's obviously a related argument, uh, that Jesus was also a priest and that his followers were priests in a kind of removed sense, but that is priests uh, by virtue of their attachment to Jesus as the eschatological high priest. Okay. So Judaism believed that at the end of time, the, when the kingdom of God penetrated into the kingdoms of this world, that the divide between those two spheres would finally evaporate and that God would rule, and but he would rule from his kingdom and worship would finally be perfected. One of the things I found so uh, enlightening as a new thought I'd not consider was kind of just sitting right at what your thesis is that even the messianic idea is ultimately a priestly idea. Yeah. Um, that, and as, a, as you say a couple points in the book, you know, when we think Messiah, we immediately think David and kingship, right. which you're not denying. Right. And I, and I don't think, we were talking to the club before, I don't think you overstate, I don't think, I think you're, Good. you acknowledge that the Davidic element is there, but you're trying to push or add to that. And then you do ultimately say that ultimately that is a priestly reality because what Jesus is coming to do and the reason why the Jewish people wanted to, wanted a Messiah to come is so that they could regain a sacred space right. in which they could worship God. Right. Right. Political that, autonomy was right. never, for the Jews, never an end for itself. Uh, it's What it was was a means to the end of worship. Of worship. I really like that. I mean, that just seems right as soon as it's said, but we never say that. You know, we, we think of it as just sort of a political reality, but yeah. yeah. How would that work within a Jewish mindset that the like what is in their mind the relationship of the Davidic line to the Aaronic line, or how does that work? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. And you wonder if so much was made to write, write on Psalm 110. But, you know, in Psalm 110, which Jesus seems to cite as a way of identifying himself, uh, there's this pre royal priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. It's a royal priesthood that David and Solomon seem to belong to. Okay. Uh, we don't know if anyone else does. Uh, Part of the point I make in the book, I don't know if you've gotten to this part in the book yet, is what's unique. David and Solomon are truly unique figures yeah, yeah, no, uh, in redemptive history because yeah. they are the ones to preside over united Israel for the, at least the length of their that, And they do these priestly things. They do like, the priestly like things. Like the whole eat the um, Elimelech, is it? Or who is it? The high priest who eats the showbread. Um, All right, David, right. which comes up in Matthew 12, which right. is a very interesting. And so thing everyone well. says, "Well, David was a screw up for taking the bread, and Elimelech was a screw up for letting him do it." Is that his name? Is that the priest's name? Well, <laughs> well, it's, Ab well uh, it's Abiathar, but Abiathar, uh, okay. yeah, but it's in the days of Elimelech. So there's a okay. whole the run going on, interesting run going on there. So, so here's the thing: it's like you don't get any hint from the text of Samuel. Uh, that what anyone did was wrong right, there. Right. And so we just say, oh, well, you know, when you're really hungry, you can break the rules. It's like, come on, dude, this is like Torah we're talking about. Right, this right. is the sanctity of the temple. You just, you know, you don't right. like, so what's going on? Well, actually, David takes on a lot of priestly roles. He wears the ephod, yeah, yeah, uh, which is a technical way right. of saying right. serving as priests. But David so, and Solomon are somewhat unique in that. Nobody else really approaches no that. No one else, it's, because the kingdom has come apart after, you know. Okay, right, so that's part of your argument, right, yeah. And yeah. so to me, it has, there's something uh, about the worship of the one true God has to be matched by the 12 tribes gathered together as a unified okay. people. And, you know, you get in Malachi, and you, you get different, uh, okay, for example, in Zechariah chapter 14, where it talks about the coming of the kingdom. Uh, and it's like the one kingdom and then the regathering of the tribes and there's some description of that and the right. coming of the Gentiles. Um, there, at that point, God will become king and God will become truly God. Uh, I think part of what that means is uh, that God's 
truly God because there's be one people to worship him. Okay. So we and, and it's at that point that the king and the priest are based functionally the same person. Right. right. And right. that the king has okay. the right to really do that because he's he's functioning on behalf of all 12 reconstituted 12 okay. tribes. And you feel like that's a pretty clear messianic expectation, or at least a strand of the messianic expectation, yeah. and, I, and I, that early Christians understand Jesus in that way. Is that totally. What Our guest on today's episode, Dr. Nick Perrin, serves as the president of Trinity International University, which is comprised of undergraduate and graduate programs, including TEDS, as well as a law school. TEDS provides flexible online programs for students who are already serving in ministry, and with training that is both rigorous and broadly evangelical, Trinity will develop your faith, knowledge, and skills to better equip you for ministry. For more information on Trinity's online degree programs, visit online.tiu.edu. TEDS. Let me, let, let's drill down though in, I, I can't remember if it's in that chapter, but then you, you deal with both the salt and light right, and the Beatitudes, which I want to say something about both those and get your dialogue. Um, so something tells me I'm going to be in trouble on the oh, no. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, that's all right. Uh, we, we, none of us can ever read everything, right? This is I mean, where it's I so open the car door and right? I roll yeah. out. Well, we have, we that's have a great question. Doors. i got to go. <laughs> we have suicide doors that we can, yeah, right. and we have ejection sheet. Um, no, but the, so first on the salt and light, really, really great um really great exposition and I and <coughs> I wish I could have read what you said before I finished my commentary because I think I would have largely adopted um, what you said but the good news is what I that what, yeah the, yeah that's, that's how it happens um, but what I did end up arguing is not identical to what you're saying but I think has a very interesting overlap okay. so I think you'll be so tell me about you'll that. be curious to, to see it and I'm getting it from a, a couple of other people but basically the salt and light um, you argue uh, Make sure I get this right. You argue the salt and light is again a messian, or is again a priestly role right. with Jesus as the eschatological high priest, and his and his sons, his disciples, right. are priests like him in the world. Right. And what else do you say about it? I want to make sure I'm getting it right. Well, that, that's uh, right. That's I, basically. I mean, it. but yeah. by, and I think part of what but, oh, because you bring out uh, sorry, covenant as or salt as a covenant issue. Yeah. Right. Okay. So salt go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, so like. You know this much better than me, but you know you read through the Beatitudes. Um, there's an undertone of suffering, like, absolutely. Especially well, it, it culminates with a ten to twelve, ten, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. With those. So, so what a great segue to now talking about light and, and salt. So either now Jesus is saying, and now for something completely different, right. um, or life, he's actually life of Brian, yeah, right, right. Right. <laughs> or he's actually saying, okay, let's right. talk about this some more by using these metaphors of of light, which I see the city on the hill. Is is Jerusalem, um, and so um, yeah, I think he's talking about eschatological Jerusalem, and then he brings in light. So you know, so it's not preservative. I mean, not that that's not also true, but it's the salt and light are priestly functions of yeah. the world. So right? okay. when you look, at the, okay, if you look at how salt is used in Torah, salt was in the priest's toolkit. So when you right. administer the sacrifices, you throw in some of the salt of the covenant. Yeah. Okay. And and what it is, it's it's a, a image of the perpetuity of the covenant. Okay. So um, and the and the fact that he's saying you're the salt, it's a metonymy for you're the new priests. Okay. So that's what's super encouraging. I don't know if this road goes through or not. <laughs> we'll see. We will find uh, out. That's what's super encouraging because even though I wish I would have had your conceptualization of the whole priestly role of Jesus, uh-huh. et cetera, I did not, and I wish I would have. But what I argue, based on some other people, it's yeah. not original to me, is that um, we have to take salt and light together as mutually informing metaphors. Because, of course, salt okay. can mean a lot of different things. Yes. It can be a preservative. It can be all these different kinds of things. I don't think this well, goes where is this going? <laughs> All right. Um, it can mean a lot of different things, but light, I think it's pretty clearly, he's just quoted Isaiah right yeah. before that section yes. in chapter four at the end of the introduction light to, the to Matthew, yeah. light to the nations, yeah. and and the Beatitudes as well. So how I take it is that salt and light together communicate the idea of covenant. So this mm-hmm. is how we overlap deeply. Mm-hmm. And that I've described what Jesus is saying, his disciples are the heralds of the new covenant which I did not connect it to priests, but that would have been the same thing. But I think the, um, 
I think that really fits that, that, in nicely with what you're You know what, what? and I didn't bring right. that out, but I, I easily could have because when you think about, okay, if Jesus' disciples are the new priests, that implies a new covenant, doesn't it, with a new kind of economy yeah, yeah, right. to go with that. Right, so I wish I would have wrote you, and you probably wish I, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think they're really complementary I I, like ideas buried here. Buried away in our Twi- offices. Twins you know. separated, <laughs> right. bro- or brother of another mother. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. So my point in all this is not to promote, <laughs> just to promote my own view over <laughs> against yours. I loved your book, right? Yeah, but do buy the book. Um, but, I mean, not, not at all to be critical. It's to actually say, once again, I thought, okay, we're not saying the exact same thing. And in this case, there's a little bit more disagreement on right. an acarism. Right. But I think they do layer together. And here's how. Go ahead. And this is the question. My understanding is that a big part of the role of the priest was actually to teach. Yes. To teach the wisdom of how to see and be in the world. Yes. Right? And we think of a priest only kind of sacerdotally in the sense of performing cultic Right. Elements, right. There, which is also true, but is that your understanding that there be a, a teaching element oh, to it and a kind of Ezra totally. model? And if so, yep. then Jesus is he is still functioning like a priest, even though he's not actually giving blessings there. He's giving a kind of apocalyptic, eschatological wisdom teaching about what it means to live the true, flourishing life. But he's doing that as the priest. Yeah. In other words, I think, so I think, thoughts on I that? Think that would yeah. work. And for me, a big part of it is an understanding that apocalyptic and eschatological language of the second temple period yeah. has become interwoven with wisdom yes. so that with that what what the apocalyptic eschatological literature of second temple judaism is doing is it's revealing a wisdom yeah. for how people can experience shalom or flourishing or in greek terms eudaimonia yes. by living according to god's revelation uh-huh. i think those are two the wisdom and um Apocalyptic strands are interwoven. See the work of Graham McCaskill and others. Uh-huh. And so, when I, with that background, when you when you read the Sermon on the Mount, I think it actually makes sense because Jesus is showing up as an apocalyptic sage. I think, uh-huh. which uh, who is revealing what the wisdom that will result in flourishing truly is. That's how I read the whole sermon. You'll kind of see, which is interesting too, if I might, to kind of connect it to your argument, and that you're saying that part of the priestly, or part of the messianic idea needs to rediscover priestly, not just be royal. That's right. And I'm actually arguing on the other side, also complimenting that, Uh that part of the messianic expectation needs to include sage. Yes. Because the philosopher, the king was a philosopher in the great expectation with Solomon again being the great example. So so you're arguing very interestingly David and Solomon's priestly role. Right. I'm suggesting that David and Solomon, especially Solomon, played a sagacious role, a a sage role, and that that's that makes the most sense in the Sermon on the Mount. Right. So again, I don't think they're contradictory, but they are putting the emphasis. Yeah, and I guess what level. what I either we don't know enough about or I don't know enough about is to what extent the sage role overlapped with. I mean, ob- there's obvious overlap between the priestly role and the role of the sage, but in, in teaching, you know, right? Is that right? The, exactly. Right, but yeah. So, but. For all those Old Testament form critics like Vesterman, you know, when we think about sage, we think about a bunch of guys gathered together in the king's court who are, you know, sitting around making proverbs up and right. like it's this kind of professional scribal class that didn't have anything to do with the cult. And, but, you know, actually when we meet the scribes in the Gospels, these guys are all attached to the temple. Yeah, well, that's, I think, right? then how Jesus is all, I mean, that's I mean, so where else, all together. Where, yeah. the, so the temple's a repository of wisdom. So, anyway, I think it, it'll probably take some cleaning up to figure out how how you draw the Venn diagram between wisdom and priest uh, and all those roles. Well, that's why I feel like I've really benefited from what you've said and why I want to revisit things. Not not that it made me believe less in Jesus' sage role, right? but it's... I feel like you've deepened and added another layer or dimension to it. I had Sage King, but I didn't have Priest, and now I feel like I've got all three of those. It's really, yeah, yeah, really helpful. So thank you. Well, it was a great book, man. I, I really, I mean, I really appreciate it, and I am gonna go back and digest it more and and enhance a lot of the things I've been working on. So thank you. All right, you really well, made a contribution. So no, thank you, thank you. Um, one final thing we like to do, if you look down in the pocket down there, you'll see some envelopes. Okay. We're getting kind of thin, but you just choose one of those, okay. and there's a random question there that... I'm going to go with red. There's a random question there that you 
answer and then I'll answer as well. Oh, so I don't know what's in there either. So Oh, so you didn't come up with a question? <laughs> well, a long or time ago, long I time put a bunch of random stuff in there and I don't know and I never know what it's going to what it's going to be. One night exactly. when you're taking an yeah. all-nighter and you can't Basically. remember. Yep. All right. So it's like a fortune cookie. Yep. Uh, where's the most interesting place you've traveled to? Ah, okay. You want to go first? No, 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 you get it. Okay. Most interesting place to travel to. Um, I would say Egypt is kind oh, of the up there. Dying to go to Egypt. My wife's dying uh, to go to Egypt. It, as it's, well. just, it's such like, man, we talk about Another history, world. right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's, so, yeah, it just, uh, everything about Egypt in terms of uh, people, you know, it's. It, Islam, uh, Muslim state tr still trying to figure itself out in many yeah. ways and get the amazing history. So, yeah. One of my, probably near the top, if not the top of my wife's bucket list is to ride a camel up to a pyramid. Yep, I've done <laughs> I that. don't know why. Have you done it? Do you I want, mean, it's probably the most touristy, cheesy yeah, thing, but like she's totally dying to cheesy. do it. And so I'll tell you my quick please. Egypt yeah. story. Yeah, please. I've got a couple of them actually, but... Uh, so I climbed one of the, this was when I was uh, in college, so many okay. years ago, but I climbed the, the smallest of the three pyramids okay. along with a friend, and uh, it was just pretty cool. And, you, so uh, you can, like, climb, I, walk I up them? I or? don't know if you can do that now. Oh, okay. But right. back in the day, you could. And uh, this guy was yelling and gesticulating, and, and then I got down lower, lower, he'd say, bakshish, 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 and I go, which is essentially a tip or a bribe, right? Oh, and okay. I and I said, okay. It's like, what? What did you do for me? I said, why do you want back sheesh? You know. And and he said, well, if you had fallen, I would have taken you to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd be dead. <laughs> that wouldn't be so much just to do. Tip insurance. He wanted to, right. He wanted a tip because he was the guy who. <laughs> he was so adamant about it. That's really funny. Good. <laughs> anyway, now over to you. Uh, Most yeah, boy, place. I've been privileged to go a lot of places but there's no doubt that i have to say new zealand oh yeah because never been there and i and i've actually and the, the my kiwi friends are going to guffaw at this and i'm not i've not even been to the south island where you get the sort of massive you know lord of the rings mountain scenes but yeah. the north island i mean all of new zealand's amazing but i was on the north island and drove from the bottom of it nearly um all the way, way, way up past Auckland into the northern little peninsula where the, the wine country of Matakana and all that. And, you know, went wow. into the, we were there in their summer, which was perfect, and went into the ocean and drove. Thankfully, I knew how to drive a stick and knew yeah. how to drive a stick on the other side of the road yeah, for my yeah, England experience, yeah, my yeah. British experience. Right. So a friend just loaned us a car. So we just drove like you've got these like hot springs, Rotorua, it's called this like volcanic area. It was just it's like surreal. That's it's amazing. So, so cool. if, have you been to New no, Zealand? You need to, you need to go. It is truly amazing. Wow. Um, the very northern part kind of reminded me of, of Italy a lot too. You know, it's kind of volcanic huh. and hilly, and like it's really cool. So wow, that's pretty easy choice oh, for me. Man. So I love that. Okay. Well, thanks, dude. It has been a delight to Thank chat you. with you, and I'm so glad you made the trip down here so we could spend some time together. And well, thanks for letting me on your show. We'll talk shop. So that's great. That's cool. Thank you. A final thanks to our episode sponsor, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. The school maintains four key values. They're Christ-centered, community-focused, church-connected, and culturally engaged. I myself am an alumni of TEDS and received a gospel-centric theological education from the school's world-class faculty. If you're interested in continuing your education, whether online or at our campus in Deerfield, Illinois, visit teds.edu. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Three really quick things. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and connect with us on social media. We'd really appreciate it. Secondly, check out the comment section below. We've put a bunch of program notes and links to interesting things there. And third, check out some of our episodes you can see linked here. Thanks. We'll see you on the road. Peace. Peace.